This is Business Rockstars. I'm Brittany Whitney, and my guests today are Griffin Thal and Paul Goodman, co-founders of Pura Vita Bracelets. Hi, guys. Thanks for joining us. Of course. So give us a little overview on how you got to where you are today and why you decided to start Pura Vita. So yeah, back in 2010, um, Paul and I went on a surf trip to Costa Rica after graduating from San Diego State. And after surfing one day, we met these guys on the beach just like making bracelets by hand. Um, we walked up to their table, bought a couple bracelets, and then went back to our hotel room that night. Um, when we looked down at our wrists, you know, we, we were like, hey, I think we could sell these back home to our friends and family. Mm -hmm. um, we came back home to San Diego, um, put them online, put them in a couple local boutiques, and yeah, then the brand kind of took off from there. Amazing. And tell us what is Pura Vita? What is your brand's mission for those who are not familiar? Yeah, our brand's mission is to help provide full-time jobs to artisans around the world by selling products that give back. So we sell bracelets, accessories, rings, earrings, necklaces, different types of jewelry. That's great. Yeah. So what was the process like? You went to Costa Rica, you saw these <coughs> bracelets, you thought, you know, we could do this. What was the process like, though, to actually getting started? I mean, like right, off, right, right from the beginning, you know, we like built a website, um, we figured out how, like how to file a business license, mm -hmm. um, you know, how to pay taxes, how to rent an office space, how to hire employees, anything that you'd really think that you have to do when you start a business, that's like what we kind of just figured out. Right. And then from there, it was like, you know, how do we scale? And then how do we optimize? And, you know, how do we outsource logistics? And, mm -hmm. you know, how do we bring more people onto our team that are experts in building a brand and that can follow the peer review mission? And you started your business with $100, grew on zero of funding, and now you're $100 million plus in revenue. Um, and a lot of entrepreneurs have this misconception that they need a million dollars in the bank to start a business. Do you have any bootstrapping tips? Um, I think from day one, we're always like super scrappy. Mm -hmm. You know, every, every dollar that we spent, it had to bring in two, you know, if we spent one. Mm -hmm. So I think from the beginning, you just need to be mindful of everything you're investing in has to make money. Like you can't lose money in those early days because right. that's just going to kill you. Yeah. And did you have a fear of failure when you guys started or did it just kind of, you just kind of went in head first? I mean, obviously there's that fear of failure, but I think we just went in with like so much determination and so much, you know, disregard to polishing up our resume and looking for jobs and just like being in this rat race that, you know, where you're just kind of like groomed to know when you're in college. Right. And I think, you know, like right when we got out of San Diego State, we're like, we want to make a name for ourselves. Mm -hmm. We don't want to use our resume. We don't want to apply for jobs and we want to, we want to make our own lifestyle. Yeah, and I think if you're going to bet on someone, bet on yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, so why not take that risk? If you fail, just try again. Right. Um, whereas, you know, most people, they think they have to go get a nine-to-five job, and that's going to pay the bills. So. Absolutely. And how has social entrepreneurship shaped your company? I mean, I think from the beginning, we've always wanted to be like a, you know, social responsible business. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it's helping out artisans, whether it's donating to charity, whether it's doing in-person events with our whole office at, um, in La Jolla. Mm -hmm. You know, we always want to do whatever we can to make a difference and make an impact. And I think our generation, and especially millennials, they're very attracted to brands like Pura Vida, brands that give back, brands that do good for the community. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, we also came in the right time with that as well. Yeah. And what made you decide that you wanted to have a charitable component to your business? And how did you get that started? I mean, I think it's just always been in our DNA. It's, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're in business to help artisans as well as help charities that we support, mm -hmm. as well as, you know, expand our brand, <coughs> hire employees, and continue to scale. Mm -hmm. um, we think business is more than just the bottom line. It's about, you know, creating good for the environment and mm -hmm. really making it a name for yourself and for the business. Um, and not just trying to make money. Yeah. And you guys have a huge social presence with a lot of influencers working with your brand. Um, how did you kind of get started with working with influencers and how did you grow your social presence? I think from the beginning, you know, everyone starts at zero on Instagram. Everyone has a phone, everyone has a camera, you know, everyone has the same tools. Right. But we also found a competitive edge with how we did our Instagram marketing, and it was working with micro-influencers and brand ambassadors. Mm -hmm. So from day one, Paul and I would walk around at the college campuses, passing out bracelets, going to sororities, fraternities, talking about Pura Vida, the same story we're telling you today. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to find a way to multiply this, and how do we... How do we be on STSU's campus, but also at NYU and also at University of Miami? How do we do that? Right. So we started recruiting these brand ambassadors or these reps on Facebook and Instagram to do the same thing that we did. And now we've scaled that program to over 100,000 brand ambassadors that talk about Pura Vida on their college campuses, in their dorm rooms, and online. That's great. Yeah. So what was the process like? You came here, made the bracelets. Then you got them into some smaller stores and now huge retailers. What was that process kind of like? I mean, I think it's definitely, you know, it's, it's like you, 
you figure something out and then something breaks and then you got to rebuild it and you figure something else out. So it's mm -hmm. anything from building a website to, you know, be, when we started, Instagram wasn't even around, you know, so Instagram wow. came out and it was like, okay, what's this new platform that we got to figure out now? Right. Um, to basically breaking the warehouse and having to find a new warehouse. So I think it's constantly just evolving mm -hmm. and every day making those, those small changes that, you know, when you look over at the long term, really add up to, you know, big changes. Right. And what were some of the biggest challenges you faced when you first started and how are they different than the challenges you face today as your company scales and grows? I think in the beginning, our biggest challenge was like inventory mm -hmm. because we were outpacing um, our sales from like the products that we had in stock. The demand was just too high from the beginning, which is, you know, we're thankful for that. Good problem um, to have. Of course. <laughs> but then with that comes other issues like fulfillment and making sure that if someone orders, like how are they going to get their order in a couple days? Mm -hmm. And, you know, with our packages being so light, we couldn't use like FedEx or UPS like, you know, you get on Amazon. So we were kind right. of always competing with Amazon shipping, um, shipping speed. So I think, you know, from the beginning, it was inventory, it was um, fulfillment, logistics, like all the stuff that's more on the back end. Um, you know, we kind of were born in the marketing area, uh, marketing era. Mm -hmm. So we were good at that, but it was kind of the back end stuff that we needed help with. Yeah. Yeah. And it's especially as like, as you scale, um, you kind of forget about the culture aspect. So that's right. something we've really focused on, you know, the past couple of years is how do we have the best possible team? How do we create the best possible environment for our pyramid employees? Right. And so that's kind of, you know, our, our main focus. Yeah, and how important is company culture to the success of your business? Because I'm sure when you first started, this was your first job, essentially. So it's not like you were in this company culture, cool environment to begin with. You had to create your own. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think from the beginning, kind of like Paul said, um, the culture was something that we wasn't our main focus. It was growth, right. growth, growth, you know. And now this past year, we moved into a new office. We got to customize everything from the ground to the lights to what kind of coffee is brewed in there. And that's been such a win for us because now when people come into Pure Vita every day, they love their job. Everyone has an ocean view. There's more snacks than you could even imagine there. <laughs> Lunch catered almost every day during the week. We celebrate you know, baby showers. We celebrate weddings. We celebrate if someone got an A on their paper. Like, I mean, right. it's, it's like a, a party in there every day. Yeah. And we love giving back to our employees. And how many employees do you guys have now? We have 35 in our office, and then we support over 650 artisans around the world. That's amazing. I yeah. love that. And Vera Bradley purchased 75% of your company for $75 million plus. Um, tell us about that experience. Yeah, I mean, it's been quite the ride for sure. I mean, you know, when we started the business, we never really wanted to start the business to sell it. It was always just kind of like a lifestyle business. Mm -hmm. um, and then when this kind of opportunity came across our plate, you know, we had to entertain it. Um, so we met with the Vera Bradley team, um, you know, very in depth. We talked about um, our synergies together, talked about how they can better help our company on the backside, like the back end of the business. Mm -hmm. And we feel that it's been, you know, so successful so far. That's amazing. Um, and what would you say the biggest challenge or obstacle that you've had to overcome has been in your business? Yeah, I would say the biggest challenge is, is always just been like scaling up our, our factories mm -hmm. and working with the artisans. You know, when they started, they were living basically on the beach. They didn't have any business experience. So we basically had to scale with them as they as we've scaled. Right. So just constantly evolving that as well as, you know, figuring out fulfillment and how to basically get our products to the customers as quick as possible. And where do you see Pura Vida in the next five or 10 years? Um, I see Pura Vida just being, you know, the largest retailer for jewelry products, kind of like what we're doing right now. Mm -hmm. um, we want people to trust our brand for bracelets, earrings, necklaces, anything, whether it's for themselves, whether it's for a gift. We want people to know that if something's coming up, that Pura Vida is going to be there for them in terms of the jewelry department. Amazing. And where can people learn more about your product and purchase? Yeah, you can buy it on puravitabracelets.com. Um, that's basically the, the easiest way to get it. Have your order to you in a couple days and basically pick out whatever you want. Great. Well, Paul and Griffin, thank you so much for joining us. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. This is Business Rockstars. These are my amazing guests, Griffin Thal and Paul Goodman, co-founders of Pura Vita Bracelets.